Hi everyone, I'm Raf. Today I'm going to talk about a new package called dynamicgrids.jl and this is a framework for dynamic grid based simulations. It's been developed out of CESA, Sustainable Agriculture Research Organization in Melbourne, Australia. And um, our modeling needs at CESA are dispersal dynamics of invasive insects, management scenarios for biosecurity interventions, predation, parasitism and interaction between genotypes, and combinations of the above. A few years ago when we started this project we realized we needed a modeling tool that was extensible so there'd be no dead ends so we wouldn't have to rewrite in a new framework or a new language. Um, composable so we can reuse old components in new models and make complex models out of simple models. With clean syntax so it's not like scripting not like writing C++ and extremely fast so we can optimize stochastic models. We also needed it to be interactive, so we had rapid feedback on the meaning of our models and the behaviour and what the ecological um, meaning was of a particular formulation we were writing as we were writing it. Um, this tool didn't exist, um, so we decided to build our own and Julia was the obvious choice given that range of requirements. At this stage we have a number of packages published um, and available on GitHub. Um, today I'm talking about dynamicgrids.jl as our general framework for modeling that you can use for all kinds of modeling besides ecological models. Um, but we also have dispersal.jl for modeling ecological dispersal dynamics. Um, and Dynamic Grids GTK and Dynamic Grids Interact provide outputs for visualizing and interacting with simulations. Uh, GrowthMaps.jl provides layers to use in dispersal.jl. Okay. Um, this framework has a number of concepts that are probably unfamiliar so we'll go through those grids rules and outputs and then we'll have a look at um, optimizations that are built into the package that make it fast and simplify the syntax and finally we'll finish with some complex simulations to show you how far the framework can be pushed the first concept i'm going to talk about is grids so a grid is basically a matrix that's updated cell by cell at each step of a simulation by some set of rules. Grids are initialized with a matrix providing the size, the element type, and the values that will be used in the simulation. Um, they can also be combined in a named tuple for multi-grid simulations. So we can have an A and a B grid, and they can be any types, they just need to be the same size. Rules are the next concept we'll look at, and a rule basically updates grids by being applied to every cell at every time step. Um, practically, there are struct of parameters with an apply rule method that's run at every cell and every time step. Rules have a number of subtypes, and working out what these are and how they behave has been a large part of developing this package. Um, we have cell rule, manual rules, neighborhood rules, and manual neighborhood rules which we won't talk about today. Basically, they determine the kinds of optimizations and the kind of behaviors we can use for each rule. Um, the first kind of rule is a cell rule, which is a very simple kind of rule. Basically, just updates a cell state based on the current cell state um, without referring to any of the other cells. It may incorporate data, external data for that um, cell position and time step, but otherwise, nothing else. Um, we can define that very simply for um, this rule that just runs an anonymous function. It's available in the dynamic grids package. Um, it defines an apply rule method in which the function is applied. Um, and as an example of that, we'll build a very simple linear growth model. Basically, we're just adding one to the current state for every time step, for every cell. Um, we initialize the grid with all zeros and then run the simulations in an output and I'll talk about what the outputs are later. The output basically looks like this linear change for the whole grid. Not that interesting without other um, rules included. The next kind of rule is a manual rule and uh, these are defined, these update arbitrary cells manually. Um, so the formulation can be very similar to a cell rule, except we use the apply rule method with a bang afterwards, because we actually need to write to the data object. Um, as an example, we'll make a random jump rule. In this rule, we can generate a random destination 
here with some skew to it so it does something interesting. Um, we can check that the destination is inside the grid bounds and then we can write to that grid half of the current state and reduce the current state by half at the current cell. Um, we can then initialize some cells on the grid with values so there's something to look at and run the rule. For that rule we get something like this. You can see that skew in where the um, cells are moving. We can also combine a rule like this and compose it into a composed model. Um, we'll combine the linear growth rule and the random jump rule. Um, some, something like this. We can do that by using a tuple um, or we can combine them in a rule set with some other simulation flags included and run that. And you can see the result is a combination of both of those rules. We have uh, growth increasing um, in the values and this um, movement to the bottom left. Um, this is a real simulation from some of our work that's um, simulating the dispersal of the seasonal dispersal of insects that can fly long distance. Um, and it has quite a similar formulation to what I've just shown, except the growth rule is using um, it's using environmental data, seasonal environmental data, to determine the growth rate for each cell. The next rule we'll look at is a neighborhood rule. Um, and these are rules that use the current state and the neighboring cell state to determine the next cell state. Um, you may be familiar with them from cellular automata. So we can define them in a similar way, but neighborhood rules always need a neighborhood field and this contains a neighborhood object. Um, you can define your own as we do in dispersal.jl for dispersal kernels, but um, provided in the package are more neighborhoods, which are a square neighborhood, von Neumann neighborhoods, and positional neighborhoods where you can define any combination of cells around the current cell. Um, and you can use these neighborhoods as iterables over the neighboring cells from within the rule. Um, as an example, um, use a, a game of life rule um, which has a more neighborhood of radius one. Um, once we define the state, the state changes for the rule. Actually defining the rule is a one-liner. Um, we're just summing the neighborhoods. And we can run that in the REPL in a terminal like this. You can see basic game of life behavior running in a terminal. Uh, the next example is a forest fire model. Basic concept of this is that the current cell is set to burning if any of the neighboring cells are burning. It's set to dead if it's currently burning and with some possibility it will be set to alive if it's currently dead. Um, we can run that with a, a more neighborhood radius one and get a pattern like this. Um, and once the randomness kicks in we get quite complex behaviors. We can also run it with a larger more neighborhood we get much faster burning because there are more neighbors on fire. Or we can run it with a positional neighborhood. We'll get burning with some direction as it's windy or something like that. And you can see the utility of these um, interchangeable neighborhoods where you can specialize, specify different kinds of behaviors but use the same rule. Okay, the last neighborhood rule I'll give an example of is complex life. And this combines multiple very complex positional neighborhoods. Um, into a sing single layered positional, na positional neighborhood. And we can use them both as iterables and sum them and use those sums to determine the, the state that's written to the cell on the next iteration. Um, and when we run that, we get a pattern like this, some quite interesting biology-like behaviors. Okay, lastly, looking at rules, we'll look at our multi-grid rules. Um, so all these rules we've looked at so far use a single grid, but we can specify using multiple grids uh, using the type system. So here we specify that we want inputs from grid one and grid two, and we want to write to grid two. So when we do this, we'll be passed in um, state one and two from those grids, and the output that we, that we return will be written to grid two. Um, in combination with that rule, we need to define our initialization grids. Um, with the same names that we've specified in the types here, grid one and two. Now we've looked at rules, we'll have a look at outputs. Um, so an output is basically 
spatial and temporal component of the simulation. Um, it includes storage and visualization of simulation frames and any spatial and temporal initialization data like the init grid, and time span, and maybe some auxiliary data that goes with the simulation. Practically, an output is a struct inheriting from abstract vector that defines a store frame and or a show frame method and holds an extent object. Um, again, like rules, there are a number of flavors of output. Um, these are just standard output, graphic outputs, and image outputs. Standard outputs store initialization data and simulation results in some way. Um, the most basic is the array output provided in the package. And this is actually the complete definition because the, um, the methods are defined in the abstract type. And this means you can define your own output types quite simply and just override the methods that you need to. And we often do this for running sim uh, simulations uh, if we need better performance than is provided with this kind of output. Um, we can um, define one of these in a script by defining the initialization grid and then defining a time span range um, here using Julia date time objects but you could use unit full or just straight numbers um, and then we can define the output like this. Next kind of output is a graphic output. Um, and these are outputs that are visualized somehow or other. Um, and they need a graphic config component, um, and this determines the frames per second and things like that as a visualization. Um, they also need to provide a show frame method where the frame is actually showed. Um, the simplest example in the package is the REPL output um, that you saw earlier. Um, it has a show frame method to go with the struct. And you can um, define that in a script um, like this. And we can use that output to run simulations in the terminal. Name it, this may be over SSH um, on a server when you can't run a graphic in, uh, image output, or may just be, just be locally. It helps if you can change the font size in the terminal. <clears throat> okay, the last kind of output is an image output. And these are graphic outputs that display images specifically and uh, dynamic, they need to define a uh, show image method to do that. So dynamic grids will generate the images for the output uh, using color schemes.jl and grid processor components. Um, and these can uh, provide layouts um, of multiple grids or composite multiple grids um, and things like that. They also provide text and date time labels to go on the grids. Most of these outputs are available in external packages to reduce dependencies. Um, Dynamic Grids GTK and Dynamic Grids Interact that you saw earlier. Dynamic Grids Interact builds on interact.jl and flatten.jl and fieldmetadata.jl to um, automatically produce um, interactive interfaces for any arbitrary model. Um, and I'll give you a, a demonstration of that. So we can define a color processor to visualize the model here using the rainbow color scheme um, and then set up the interact output passing in the model. And then we can run that inside the Atom interface, but you can also run it in a web interface or an electron or something. Um, here you can see it in the plot pane, we have buttons to run the simulation and change, change the frame rate. But we also have sliders to change the, um, the, the, form, the parameters of the formulation. So we can change the probability of regrowth. We can change the probability of combustion as the simulation is running. And you should see here changes in the dynamics as we move these sliders. And that will work, work for any model that you pass in, not just this model. Now I've looked at outputs, we'll have a look at some of the optimization that go into making this package work, making it fast and making the um, scripts simple. The first is avoiding bounds checks. So generally neighborhoods ex can extend beyond the bounds of the average grid. Um, the edge of the neighborhood can hang off the edge of the grid. Um, to get around this, we extend grids by the neighborhood radius using octetarrays.jl. Um, and this means neighborhood rules don't need to do any bounds checks. Um, and that simplifies syntax a lot and it improves performance by having conditionals. The next optimization 
is efficient neighborhood loading. Um, we do this by instead of loading the whole neighborhood for every cell, um, we load a small column at a time of the of the main grid and copy that to multiple neighborhood buffers. Um, we then run the rule on those buffers and afterwards shuffle the buffer across and load another column. This greatly reduces array reads and means buffers are small enough to be in the L1 cache where the grid is normally in the L3 cache because it's too big. Um, it also means we can use um, blast routines on small buffers, which is really useful using dispersal kernels, which is quite large and you need to do dot multiplications. Third optimization is sparse opt, which is a flag we can pass in to the simulation. And basically this just skips rules for zero values and zero values in the neighborhood. Um, it tracks whole blocks of cells and skips them if they contain only zeros. And you can see that here in the gray areas of the visualization, which aren't being run. The next rule is a chain rule. And this is just a rule that can wrap other kinds of rules. Um, it works by skipping array reads and writes between those rules. And it also work, works when we have multiple grids. Um, so we're just rerouting the outputs of one rule to the required inputs of the next rule and working all that out at compile time so it doesn't have much runtime overhead. Okay, now we've looked at optimizations. I'll finish with um, some complex simulations. Um, and these are real simulations that we've done at Caesar. Um, so we can define a large simulation with multiple grids here, four grids. Um, and define some rules. Here we're using um, three of those grids in the rule and writing as inputs and writing out to one of the grids. And we have about 15 rules like this in the whole rule set. We can define the whole rule set with chains of different groups of rules and um, other um, flags for the simulation. Define a large a layout processor for all four of those grids um, here. Um, with four color schemes, um, some a text configuration, and a layout in a matrix. And then we can define an output. Um, here we just use a GIF output, so the output will be directly written to disk. And we can run that. You can see the result is this interactive simulation. There's actually feedback between most of these grids where um, the detected grid operates off the population grid and it, uh, the track grid works off the detected grid. It feeds back onto population groups via quarantine and other models that we have. And this allows us to play with different quarantine scenarios and different levels of eradication and see what the likely results could be. Um, and also the cost group gives give us some idea of quantifying the, the for and against of the costs. So yeah, this is about the most complex model we've used the framework for. Um, I'm keen to see what other kinds of um, models people would use the framework for outside of ecology, maybe in fire modeling or in urban, um, urban growth modeling or something. Um, and that's about it. That's about all I wanted to talk about. Um, I'd like to thank everyone at CESAR who supported this work, um, especially, especially James Maynard, who's been a large part of developing these packages and um, started this project. And my contact details are there as well. Thanks.